what I'd like to do today is share a street level experience of an industry in transformation. I mean, the economists have ideas about what transformation is like, and I, I know that all sorts of academics at the Innovation Foundation and at the Rotman School, they've all got their ideas of transformation. I've lived it at street level. I, I, I know what it feels like. I, I know what the chaos of it is like. And I thought that might be the most useful thing to share with. Like, how does it actually happen? Uh, but before doing that, uh, maybe put it in context for what it means to Canadians. It, you know, the scale and speed of the change in the global economy is completely unprecedented. We, you know, we, it's, it's like a, a hockey stick, like an exponential curve. And we all grew up with change happening like this. And all of a sudden, the exponential curve has started to move. Uh, and all our habits of how to survive change are based upon a lifetime of culture and learning at this part of the hockey stick. And now we're at this part. And it's just going to go steeper and steeper. And so the, the exponential growth in the speed and scale of global economic change is the single biggest thing that's facing us as Canadians. Uh, what's changing? Well, what's produced in the global economy? Mo a huge amount of value produced today didn't even exist in people's imagination five years ago. Where is it being produced? The shift in the centers of production from which the idea ten years ago that the world would depend upon China to lead it out of a, a recession is just inconceivable. Uh, how things are being produced, the amount of integration of the global economy Again, it's way beyond anything anyone could have believed in. And who's producing? In the next 20 years, the middle class will be the single biggest part of the global population. We'll have gone from basically all of human history of subsistence farmers being the biggest part to actually members of the modern economy, the middle class being the biggest part. This is huge. It's, it's as if McLuhan's global village Thomas Friedman's flat global economy and Moore's law of innovation, speed of innovation, have fused. Uh, and, and every single Canadian, every single Canadian feels the shock of the speed of change. It impacts the quality of life in every nook and cranny of this country. And those who haven't had it slap them across the face yet are going to feel it. And so I think that. The single thing that we should be most concerned about is do we have the adaptive capacity? We talk about are we competitive, but we haven't been talking sufficiently are we adaptive. Being competitive today is worth today. The ability to change, to adapt at this speed is what's going to determine our quality of life. And so I'm going to share the story of the forest industry being slapped in the face. It's you know, the short version of the talk is forest industry was happy 10 years ago, too complacent. Uh, we got walloped. Uh, we staggered around looking confused and hurt. We pulled ourselves together, changed a bunch of things, and now we're feeling pretty self-confident. And of course, history doesn't move that cleanly. It's more amoeba-like. But that's a basic storyline. So like 10 years ago, we were, we were happy campers. We were the world's largest exporter of forest products. We were making profit. We had a million Canadians uh, direct and indirect employed. We were the biggest uh, source of balance of trade. Uh, it was, was you know, 300 communities. And if you asked, are we competitive, we'd say, well, of course we're competitive. Uh, no one's doing better. Look at our profits. Look at our market share. But if you did a stress test, I know you only do it for banks, but if you did a stress test on the sector, I said, could it withstand the stress? You would have seen that most of the industry was assuming a 70 cent dollar, was it 65, a 70 cent dollar. I remember a meeting in which David Everson, when he was still CEO of Canfor, told his colleagues that he was planning on an 80 cent dollar, and they all looked at him like he was a total nut bar. Uh, and he was wrong by, by how much, at 20 percent. Uh, and he, he was the radical. Uh, we were totally dependent upon the U.S. In fact, we were not going to China, or we had pulled back and selling to Europe. 
because the U.S. was such an easy customer. We had overcapacity. Uh, this is partly because of the provincial government's uh, pertinency rules. That they say you can only have so much lumber for each town. So we had you know, maybe three times as many mills as, as we needed. Uh, and we weren't investing enough because you couldn't invest in a big mill because the province wouldn't let you consolidate your lumber supply into it. We were doing what government required of us environmentally, but we weren't doing any more than that. And we, we thought that we could deal with the environmental challenges just by telling them, here are the facts, and you know, we're right and you're wrong. And we had something that might be called commodity consciousness. We hadn't actually thought about marketplaces so much as we chop down trees, turn them into lumber, put them out in the market, and hope someone bought them. We had no sense of customer. It was you know, just the total opposite of what you think of, of a market-based business. So here we are, happy, profitable, hugely successful, and completely unable to pass a stress test. It might be interesting to go through Canadian industrial sectors and ask how many could. And then, perfect storm hit. Uh, and, uh, well, let's go through it. The information age came. All of a sudden, you know, newspapers started to shrink as people went to Craigslist, and, and the internet took over. Uh, environmentalism, you know, people actually began to understand climate change, and strangely, the public stopped blaming us the way they used to. It was better when they blamed us. They started to blame themselves and change their buying habits. So when the, when the people used to say, well, industry's bad and better clean up their act, but I'll buy what I want, we can still sell. But the big shift happened when people started to blame themselves as much as us. All of a sudden, environmentalism became a huge market uh, threat. And environmentalists, being the smart, strategic people they are, figured that out and started going out after our big customers instead of after us. And we were in a huge problem with our marketplace. So you had info age, environmentalism, and then the dollar went from 65 cents to a dollar. Doesn't seem totally a certain place for a dollar to be. Uh, but that 66% rise, all of our inputs were in Canadian dollars, all our sales, sales in American dollars. So it was like a two thirds rise in the cost of, of doing business. I remember a uh, CEO of, of Catalyst Paper telling me that when he came, he was 12% you know, below what he needed to break even. And he, he fired his VPs, he did a new union contract, he brought a new financing, and he got it up, and then the dollar went up two cents, and he was right where he was. Uh, it was a huge, huge impact to try and adjust to that. Uh, in addition to that, it turns out the U.S. housing market collapsed and brought down the rest of the global economy, and we had to sell wood to the U.S. housing uh, industry to make a living. Uh, the shift of global growth went to China, and we were busy keeping our relationships up with the U.S. and, and Europe. Uh, and then we had two plagues hit us. We had a plague of beetles and a plague of softwood uh, lobbyists. Uh, and between, <laughs> between the two of them, I could just... And so anybody who could look at the numbers, anybody who believed in projections, could tell that we were finished. I mean, there is no way that our trajectory was going to change. Uh, it wasn't a perfect storm, of course. It was a change in climate. It was a total shift in the structural underpinnings of our industry. So what did it feel like? Well, I, I, I had a meeting last year with a bunch of mayors from northern Ontario. And we were just basically over beer. Uh, they were drinking beer. I learned long ago not to drink with mayors. Uh, they, they, <laughs> They, they, they were saying that it's like, you know, you go to bed one night in your own neighborhood. Uh, you got health care, bump into someone, they say sorry. Uh, you know everyone at the rink. Uh, it feels like, you know, you got Canadian values and, and your, your dad had a job and your uncle has a job at the mill. You wake up the next morning and you're no longer in your neighborhood, you're in the global marketplace. And it's not a nice neighborhood. There's no health care. No one says they're sorry. They'll, they'll knock you down, steal your pacemaker, take your job. Uh, and, and, and it's a culture shock. And the reactions, you know, you know we spent a long time, about, well, how do people react? Well, people get angry, you know, because they have a sense of entitlement. Get really, it's not fair. 
you often see this in, you know, in some of the less, less uh, progressive unions sometimes, you see this sort of, we have a right to our jobs, we have a right to prosperity. You don't have those rights uh, in the global marketplace, and if you're selling to the world like we do as Canadians, you don't get to live just at home, you have to live in the global marketplace. And then the other reaction is depression, like people just lose self-confidence. Uh, and just like an entitlement can make you resistant to change, even worse, uh, that sort of depression, that lack of self-confidence, just kind of saps the energy out of a town. And this desperation, and, and you know, it's like being someone having difficult cancer, there are a lot of snake oil salesmen telling you that, you know, eat 50 bananas or uh, you, you know, take the right bath or whatnot, it'll miraculously go away. Well, those sorts of people uh, work economically too. You know, if you just build this plan to try this technology, it'll all get better. And, and, and to be fair, industrialists, mayors, and politicians are all seduced by this because the pain is so hard. And if you're a CEO or a manager or a leader in the industry, the personal pain is unbelievable. Not only are you laying off thousands of people. You're destroying the community you live in. The CEO from Tenbeck's wife told him that they have to move to Toronto, they lived in Temiskaming, because she can't go anywhere in town without facing someone who her husband uh, has laid off, or their wife, or their child at the swimming pool. Uh, and, and you think, you know, if you're a leader in industry, you think you have a sense of personal power, but everything you used to do doesn't work. Or if your father built up the business, you're feeling your father, you're feeling your uncles who depend upon the dividends, you're feeling basically the whole family's legacy. And then you try and figure out what to do, and it's not obvious. Some of them just went into denial, say, it's a cyclical industry, it'll come back, we just have to hold our breath. And of course, they all turn blue. Uh, <coughs> and those who said, well, we have to find a new path, well, it turns out from the inside, the solution isn't obvious. Is it, you know, is it bioenergy? Should we, you know, should we sacrifice fiber to make the environmentalists happy? Where, where, you know, should we start selling to India? Where is it? It, it's all clear after you fix things. But in the moment, it just feels like confusion, uh, loss, and uncertainty. And it takes huge, huge courage, vision, and determination for an industrial leader, for a union leader, for us, a, a political leader, to actually see a path, not listen to the depressed feelings, not listen to everyone talking, because that's the other part, which I, makes it even worse, is everyone around you doesn't believe in you. Your investors don't believe in you, your suppliers don't believe in you, your customers don't believe, even the government is tempted to give you palliative care instead of transformative care. I can't tell you how many MPs uh, were ready to try and help save a mill rather than figure out what the industry should be like in the future. Uh, so everywhere around, people are reinforcing this story, you can't win. You're over, leave gracefully, uh, you're just going to be a little rump of what you used to be. But there was in the industry sufficient will, courage, vision, indomitable spirit to try and do something. And we did it. Uh, and the adaptation came in many areas. Well, the first, the obvious one is we improved our productivity. And, uh, we're 20% better than the Canadian average, better than the Americans. We did it partly through uh, some investment. And thank you, Michael and James, for the accelerated capital depreciation. It helps. Uh, but mostly, mostly through workers, unions, and managers, local managers, finding impossibly brilliant solutions to things that no one thought could be done. It was huge. Uh, but all the improvement in productivity just kept us in the box. It was all necessary but not sufficient. We had to find solutions that would get us off the treadmill of getting more and more productive in a box that didn't work. And the, the first thing we said is, let's do value added. We've been saying that all along. But we did do value added, we haven't done value added because we can't compete on labor prices. So then uh, we started asking, could we do value extraction? Can we get more value out of every, every tree harvested? And together with the Department of Natural Resources and, and, and some provinces, 
uh, we started to do a study of what we call value pathways and asked, what's the highest and best value for a ton of wood? Is it pulp and paper? Is it lumber? Is it bioenergy? Is it bioplastics? What can you do with it? Where, and when we say value, we meant uh, jobs, dollars, and minimal environmental footprint. And we actually did this study. Uh, it took us a couple of years. We, we, we tested 36 different technologies. And we found all sorts of paths in which the value to the industry of alternative products would make the industry economically viable. In fact, we found that there was going to be $200 billion of global marketplace for bioproducts, everything from uh, nano crystals pulled out of trees that can make uh, computer screens or false teeth really hard, to pharmaceuticals, to additives, to building materials, uh, to smart papers. We found all sorts of things which actually had economic value, which would not replace the existing industry, but give it enough extra product that the cost of harvesting trees and processing them would actually turn out to be profitable. So we took uh, what used to be the old paradigm of value added, created a new paradigm of value extracted, and found an economic path. And then with the environmentalists who were, while we were suffering, uh, busy kicking us while we are on the ground, we went and said, does this make any sense? Do you guys really think that uh, beating us up is in the end going to get you where you want to go. And we quietly went away for two years and held the world's most difficult, quite complex, extremely aggravating conversations, uh, and developed a pathway where we together, I wouldn't say holding hands, but pretty, yeah, walking pretty close to each other, uh, would bring the industry to the highest possible standards of environmental accomplishment uh, in the global industry, with, with a partnership in which the environmental community agreed that they would take responsibility with us to make sure jobs aren't lost, and we would take responsibility with them to make certain that the industry has the least possible negative environmental footprint. Again, it was breaking the paradigm. Instead of thinking we just have to add value, uh, instead of thinking we had to beat the environmentalists and prove them wrong, we said, why not just recruit them? Why not make them part of the team? Uh, and then with markets, instead of just depending upon the U.S., uh, we spent time, invested huge resources in China and Asia, and we are now Canada's single most successful export all over Asia. To Asia, we're number one in Asia, number one in China, number one in India. Completely reversed our dependence on the U.S. We still sell lots to the U.S., but we are far less uh, dependent. In this story of, of brave, insightful, imaginative entrepreneurship is a uniquely Canadian piece. So we did all these things together, uh, A, as a sector. It wasn't one company at a time. We actually got together and said, we are suffering together, we are losing together. Can we figure out a pathway together? We did biopathways as a sector. We did the boreal agreement as a sector. We spent time and effort in China as a sector. It's a particularly Canadian approach to industrial innovation, and we did it in partnership with government. Again, a uniquely Canadian concept. We didn't do the value pathway study alone, we did it with governments. We didn't uh, go to China alone, we went with both government support and uh, government money. A lot of our uh, new bioproducts, the development, the first mover support came from government. So, it, it, it is a particularly pleasing piece of Canada that this very traditional industry that was reeling became a radically innovative industry by being particularly Canadian, by trying to solve problems uh, collaboratively within the industry and with governments. So what were the lessons from this experience? Well, if you want to head an industry association, don't start just before the great storm. <laughs> Not smart. Uh, luckily, my performance pay wasn't based upon industry uh, economic performance, or I would have been paying them. Um, aside from that, I think the first thing is attitude is everything. 
I remember Ivan Felicke, when, when he was still chief statistician, giving a speech about all the social projections. And he must have gone on for an hour and a half, as only Ivan could, with graphs and all of this. And at the end, he said, but you know, none of that is necessarily true. It's all a choice. That's what will happen if we don't change policies. And if we change policies, all those graphs could move here and there. And, and it, it's such a huge lesson that if you look at where things are going, you're only going to find out what will happen if you don't change. And what the forest industry's uh, transformation tells us is don't believe the Cassandras. Cassandra is right, only if you don't change. But we do have the capacity to make choices. We have the capacity to choose our future. Now, we can choose to keep the old industry, but we could choose to transform and continue to survive. Uh, and that capacity to make choices at a time in which everyone says you're done is a huge lesson. And I think we should learn it for every single industrial sector in Canada. The second lesson is that transformation is transformation of what you are. Like almost everything that we did that successful was based upon who we were, which is the forest industry, makers of lumber, pulp, and paper, the bioproducts or bioproducts of that, or byproducts of that, the environmental progress is natural to an industry that depends upon nature. Uh, we, we took who we were and transformed rather than try and ask who could we become uh, without reference to where we're starting from. And related to that, we learned to look down and out at the same time. Down at our core businesses, at our people, at our staff, at our communities, uh, down at our traditions, down at our fundamental wiring, our, 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 uh, our skeletons as an industry, to make sure they were sound while we looked out to new markets, new products, new business models, new ways of doing things. Often we hear that you know, you've got to change, you've got to develop a new business model, and, and all the emphasis is out. Or, and I see, certainly see this happen in my industry, in times of, of change people say, I just got to take, you know, boat is sinking, I'm going to just keep bailing and keeping it afloat without really looking out at where it's going. And one of the key lessons for me is you got to do both simultaneously. Another lesson is that collaboration works. I mean, as a hockey nation, we probably already figured out that passing the puck works better than hogging it. Uh, and uh, yes, everyone has to do their job, and yes, uh, this huge competition, but it's also true that working with people, trying to understand where they're coming from, uh, trying to find win-win solutions is the most powerful thing in today's global economy. You know, when I was talking about how this changed, integration. What does integration mean? It means parts that weren't connected before are now working together. And, and the capacity to reach out and see how you can connect uh, is a huge, huge determinant of economic success. And government matters. Government can be a huge obstacle to transformation when government steps in to try and save ailing mills or to freeze the status quo. And you might say, well, who'd do that? It's so dumb. But if you if you're, have to make a living by getting elected, uh, it's really hard to say to people, actually, I'm going to let the town close. I'm going to let you guys go through that huge misery of your house that you spent your whole life trying to pay off now being worth nothing that your town falling apart. Of course politicians feel the responsibility to step in and save the town. But when you do it, when you move from the feeling of, uh, to doing it, you basically stop the transformation and prolong the pain. Uh, and government stepping in to accelerate transformation by investing in R&D, by having tax rules that encourage investment, by helping with transformation to, to, to green processes, by helping with first movers, by helping market penetration. Government that does that uh, helps the industry move and transform very quickly. So where are we now? We got 600,000 good, secure, high-tech, well-paid jobs. That's the... Uh, both direct and indirect. We're 2% of Canada's GDP, second biggest contributor to the uh, balance of trade. But much more important than any of that, 
We have set a platform of imagination, creativity, uh, courage that has given the industry what, what I think is best called a sober self-confidence. A self-confidence that we're doing the right things, we know how to do it, and we can keep changing. And compared to 10 years ago, when we were happy campers who would fail a stress test, today we're sober campers who would pass the stress test. Thank you.